1952, history played two cruel jokes, reshaping human breathing's fate. The first occurred that winter in London, where the city was engulfed in a thick yellow-green fog, a mix of industrial phlegm and coal soot from fireplaces, completely blocking daylight. For five days, pedestrians couldn't see their feet. Hospital thresholds were trampled, and ambulances crawled through, filled with citizens unable to breathe. When the smoke cleared the city, counted the cost. Nearly 12,000 died. The culprit behind the disaster is the air we rely on. Today, we know it's sulfur oxides, but 200 years ago, air was the alchemist's last magical domain. People believed life was a candle burning in the flesh, eventually releasing a mysterious substance called phlogiston. When air is full of phlogiston, it becomes bad air, unable to support fire or life. In 1774, Priestley used a lens to focus sunlight on mercury oxide, releasing a new gas. It rekindled the dying flames, extending the trapped mice's lifespan fourfold. Yet, as a phlogiston believer, he named this miraculous substance dephlogistonized air, thinking it absorbed phlogiston to aid combustion. Priestley didn't realize he missed the honor of humanity's encounter with oxygen. The accolade went to French chemist Lavoisier. In 1777, after discussions with Priestley, he conducted experiments proving that burning involves combining with a component in the air, becoming heavier. He named this gas oxygen, overthrowing the reign of phlogiston. Thus, breathing was redefined as slow combustion. Every breath adds fuel to the fire of life. History is full of ironies. The genius who proved breathing ultimately died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. Meanwhile, the priest who first discovered oxygen clung to his old dream of phlogiston, refusing to acknowledge he had unleashed a new era of chemistry. Lavoisier defined the chemistry of respiration, but how did the body's furnace achieve fuel exchange? The answer was complex. For nearly one, 500 years, Galen's teachings weighed on anatomy. He believed the lungs were merely fans cooling the heart. In the 17th century, Newton's enemy, British experimentalist Robert Hooke, staged a shocking drama at the Royal Society. He opened a dog's chest in public, and the lungs collapsed like a deflated balloon. As the crowd watched, Hooke inserted a tube into the trachea, connected it to a bellows, and rhythmically inflated the air. As fresh air was pushed in, the dying dog's heartbeat normalized. Once inflation stopped, the dog struggled. Hook proved that breathing's essence lies not in chest inflation, but in continuous fresh air exchange. Its bellows push air into the lungs, the origin of positive pressure ventilation. This contrasts with our natural method, negative pressure breathing, where we expand the rib cage to create negative pressure, drawing air in. The mechanical embodiment of this is the iron lung. It's a giant negative pressure tank, like a steel coffin wrapping the patient. Periodic vacuuming moves the chest, prolonging breathing. Bellows and iron lungs, positive and negative pressure, these clash for ages. In 1952, the final word in this debate came. The same year London was fogbound, when a polio epidemic hit Copenhagen, Denmark. The virus attacked the medulla, paralyzing the victim's respiratory muscles. The only hope was the iron lung, but there was just one in the city, and dozens of paralyzed children arrived daily. Even with it, mortality was 87%. The children didn't die from the virus, but were drowned by carbon dioxide and phlegm they couldn't expel. Desperate, anesthesiologist Bjorn Ibsen proposed a radical plan, abandon the iron lung. He suggested cutting the trachea, inserting a tube, and using human power to squeeze air into the lungs and remove sputum. Colleagues strongly opposed this idea, deeming it a reckless experiment. Yet, when 12-year-old Vivi Ebert was turning blue and near death, Ibsen resolutely performed the operation, manually squeezing air into her lungs with determination. A few hours later, the girl's bruised face turned rosy. The hospital expanded this practice, and hundreds of medical student volunteers worked shifts to force-feed air to each dying child. 
The ward became a factory, driven by countless hands and filled with life's rhythm. Mortality dropped from nearly 90% to below 25% in weeks. The next year, the first modern ICU was established in Copenhagen. The iron lung was replaced by efficient positive pressure ventilators, marking the start of modern critical care. A tale of two cities in 1952 reflects two sides of human breathing history. In Copenhagen's hospital wards, we used machinery to overcome paralysis, but ignored the greater suffocation we created on London streets. We found a London fog never truly vanished. It turned into industrial dust, car exhaust, and cigarette smoke. These pollutants built up in our bodies, causing the relentless gasping of COPD patients and the silent spread of lung cancer cells. Lung cancer, once rare in the 19th century, is now the leading cancer killer. We unknowingly became victims of a fog we created. This threat persisted for decades until the coronavirus arrived. It tears apart humanity's illusions about breathing, making us realize its boundaries aren't just our mouths and noses. Every breath is a vital exchange with the world, whether in a closed elevator, a crowded subway, or on a transatlantic flight. We share the same air with strangers, a network woven by our breaths that tightly binds all humanity as a community with a shared future. Today, this network bears an unprecedented burden. Wildfires from climate change send toxic smoke into the upper atmosphere. Ecological imbalances causing habitat destruction let viruses cross species barriers. Misuse of antibiotics breeds superbugs beyond drugs reach. All this will dissolve into shared air, returning to lungs with each breath. It took us nearly 200 years to truly learn how to save breath. Now, who will ensure another century of free breathing for all humanity?